teaches at uh, Munich University. And uh, her speciality is teaching contemporary and modern American literature. And um, that's how I got to know her. She's originally from the United States, of course. She used to teach at the University of Urbana-Champaign in, in uh, I think it's Illinois. Yeah? And uh, now she's in, in Munich and we are happy to have her in Munich to run seminars and courses for us. So uh, without further ado, Amy, over to you. Your topic is digital teaching and learning, the humanities, challenges and innovations, principles and practices and pitfalls. The floor is yours. Thank you, Gerhard. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this conference, to reflect on the challenges and innovations of digital learning. I would especially like to thank Gerhard Finster for his support of my teaching through the teacher training workshops at Dellingen Academy, which allowed me to experience a sense of camaraderie with teachers of English throughout Bavaria. These have been some of my fondest memories of teaching in Germany. These sessions relied very much on in-person attendance, and we never imagined at that time that we would exclusively teach online. But having run a session on teaching African-American literature, online for Dillingen in September, I realized that it can be done in a meaningful way. We can reach out to each other across Zoom and support each other in our teaching and learning journeys. After having taught college courses online for over a year and reading and reflecting on the experience with peers, students, and scholars, I would like to share my experience. This talk is structured according to the following themes, uh, principles, perspective, communication, innovations, collaborations, and reflections. First, in addressing principles, we might consider the core values that we bring to our work and how we apply them in practice. This is always the key to teaching. First, we need a sense of purpose and relevance, which we pass on to our students. Technology is a tool that we use to teach. It is not the end in itself. In order to have our courses remain relevant, we need to communicate the purpose and the relevance of the course material and the assignments to our students. With the loss of in-person teaching, the sense of purpose needs to be more directly communicated or it risks being no more than a white screen in cyberspace. For me, this means linking the content of the course with recent events. A course in Harlem Renaissance literature, for example, which focuses on the poetry of writers such as Langston Hughes and his blues and jazz style with contemporary music that draws on this style and themes of racial injustice that continue to this day. Collaboration is key to the sense of relevance. And by this, I mean the sense of collaboration between the instructor and students. In remote learning, in courses that, are, that I teach are luckily smaller, around 10 to 25 students, I make an effort to get to know the students individually, to have them introduce themselves and their hobbies or handwerk now, to know their names, how they are doing, to make sure each student is involved in some way during the class session. The sense of collaboration with me and with each other, whether they are preparing presentations or in group discussions in breakout rooms, allows for a stronger sense of participation in the course. The concept of authenticity has arisen many times in discussions of online learning. So that teaching is not a performance, but seems to have relevance and a link to reality, to come out of the core values of the course, and in this case, in the humanities. As Kevin Burden, a professor in educational technology at the University of Hull, England, noted in a recent talk, innovating and transforming mobile pedagogy is the rhetoric and the reality Authenticity and impact must be considered in the context of the discipline and subdiscipline. What makes our discipline impactful? How can this be measured? We might think then of how we apply these practice, these principles to our own practice of teaching. While this may seem obvious, after attending Professor Burden's talk, I did just this in an upper level literature course by introducing a set of principles expressed directly in an article on literary recovery based on research in a, in a personal archive. I asked students to consider the principles they use in their own research, whether they take an objective or personal stance and to what end. 
When is a personal connection to the subject appropriate and not? What were their preferred models for research? This led to an interesting discussion based on questions of authenticity and impact. What are we doing and why? What is the significance of this research? During a time when connection and purpose can seem lost, such questions explored with peers can help motivate learning. In terms of teaching American literature then, I focus on the following. Course content, literature in historical and cultural contexts, developing critical and academic writing skills, and allowing students the time to consider its relevance in terms of academic work and the profession and in a contemporary social context. In teaching in diverse classrooms, I emphasize the significance of an individual perspective based on cultural experience. And so I'll develop the vantage point, this vantage point a, a bit further. My experience teaching digitally, which I consider largely positive, comes out of a position where digital technology is supported. It was crucial that the tools set in place by the administration were easy to use, the directions were clear, and they provided orientation sessions to make sure these, these were supporting our courses, not providing further complications. The students taking my courses, while diverse, have access to computers and Wi-Fi. They are generally in their late teens and early 20s, mm -hmm. and they do have common interests in literature and culture. A subset will become teachers. They are also very interested in other cultures. Many have crossed national borders for international exchanges through the Erasmus program. As educators, it is important to help our students gain a perspective to understand the current moment. In a talk that I gave at LMU on US education and the pandemic, literary and cultural insights, as part of an online lecture series, I compared the responses to the pandemic today and adjustments in the early 20th century during outbreaks of tuberculosis in the US. This period, which also included the Spanish flu in 1918-1919 and the polio epidemic was certainly a time of contagion. One interesting finding was the prevalence of outdoor schools or open air learning during this period as a necessity a trend that is still used today in response to the pandemic. There are a couple of comparative pictures. You might think of how times have changed or if they have. This photograph from 1912 <clears throat> appeared in a recent article in the New York Times, schools beat earlier plagues with outdoor classes, we should too and includes images of students being educated on rooftops, on the decks of ferries, or less comfortably wrapped in blankets in classrooms, giving the appearance of soldiering on in a way that conformed to local concerns about contagion. The author Gina Belafonte notes, in the early years of the 20th century, tuberculosis ravaged American cities, taking a particular and often fatal toll on the poor and the young. In 1907, two Rhode Island doctors, Mary Packard and Ellen Stone, had an idea for mitigating transmission among children. Following education trends in Germany, they proposed the creation of an open air classroom. Within a matter of months, the floor of an empty brick building in Providence was converted into a space with ceiling height windows on every side kept open at nearly all times. The subsequent New England winter was especially unforgiving, but children stayed warm in wearable blankets known as Eskimo sitting bags and with heated soapstones placed at their feet. The experiment was a success by nearly every measure. None of the children got sick. While it may seem that outdoor learning is far from even the opposite of digital learning, we have seen in recent years that these can and do come together. And in order for students to have a sense of balance, we need to encourage and support both their on-screen and off-screen lives, or as students call it, IRL, in real life. As Melinda Wenner Moyer notes, as such outdoor schools were the precursor to today's alternative schools, including mm -hmm. pods and micro schools. In the study of mobile pedagogies in which students take mobile devices out of the classroom for research projects, Kevin Burden pursues an established path in the UK called Citizen Inquiry that combines community engagement, research, and science 
In his example, students worked on a recycling project as part of a study using mobile devices, an impactful pursuit with applications for our teaching. In the humanities then, in upper level secondary and university classes, such applications are directly related to education and community engagement. Organizations such as Mo the Modern Language Association support such projects, which can be found on their website, Digital, Pro Digital Pedagogy and the Humanities, Concepts, Models, and Experiments in the MLA Commons. In order to understand our own moment in the context of literary history, I've turned back to earlier literary periods. In his work, Ethnic Modernism, Werner Zollers focuses on the period between 1910 and 1950 in the US, which includes two world wars, an economic depression, developments in technology, transportation and urbanization, waves of, of immigration and migration, and corresponding innovations in aesthetic expression and literature, art, and music. This period also includes outbreaks of the Spanish flu, tuberculosis, as I mentioned, until Robert Koch received the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1905, and we're still referring to the Robert Koch Institute as we check our statistics, and the peak years of polio with major outbreaks in 1916 and 1952. Dr. Jonas Sachs' polio vaccine was approved in 1955. With the prevalence of such illnesses, a sense of mortality and a search for meaning hovers over modernist works. Themes often addressed in these works include the following, a focus on nature and culture, death and rebirth, a questioning of social institutions, innovations and style and form. We realize that limitations inspire creativity. One example of this, which often comes to mind, is the poem by Hilda Doolittle, also known as HD, written in response to the bombing of London, the Blitz during World War II. The last six lines of her poem resonate today and the metaphor of searching for a map and being unsure of, but hopeful about the destination, which can depend on one's personal and cultural perspective. We are voyagers, discoverers of the not known, the unrecorded, we have no map, Possibly we will reach haven, heaven. A more recent example, which has been captured on video and in print is Amanda Gorman's poem, The Hill We Climb, recited and performed at President Joe Biden's inauguration ceremony. In an unforgettable performance, this 22 year old African-American poet met and indeed transcended the occasion, capturing the tumultuous and hopeful moment of that day, ending her poem with the following six lines. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it, where there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. As a young woman, the age of many of our students, Amanda Gorman, her presence and the lyrical and visual power of her poetry would be a study in itself. Digital teaching with its variety of modalities in audio, video, and print would enhance such a project. As I end this first half of the talk, I would like to quote Lin-Manuel Miranda's Hamilton, the musical, which through digital streaming was accessible to the public this summer on Disney+. Plus. Along with his lyrics with vaccine resonance, I am not throwing away my shot. I guess this was used in the US. The poignant question, who lives, who dies, who tells your story, expresses the significance of the work we do, even if we don't think of it in such dramatic terms. We give the students the tools to tell their story. In the next half of the talk, I'm going to speak to the actual practice of teaching on the ground from my experience. To find the map, so to speak, to help students achieve a sense of mastery, authenticity, independence, and collaborative innovation, I would propose not reinventing the wheel, but building on what works, trying to mitigate social loss and provide a variety of learning experiences through digital forums, networks, and guidance through internet sources. One central point crucial to overwhelm students and teachers is communication. In all these realms then, I would suggest to be clear and concise, 
in the personal realm to model openness, to admit the difficulty of this, to focus on the solution, to be fair and equitable. It is important, as we've stressed throughout, that students know how to use the tools, that we know how to use them as well, and that we have support in doing so, that we explain the relevance to their academic, personal, and social progress. When we think about digital teaching, the challenges and opportunities, we can acknowledge the, the ease of access that Zoom allows that we're experiencing right now. It can't be understated. The way that it brings people together, the ability to participate, the broader networks that we are all a part of. There is also Zoom fatigue, the difficulty of discussion, the hesitation, uh, the inequality of access. Younger students have more difficulty with Zoom entering the conversation. They need more social practice. I, I see this even from younger students in their teens to older students in their 20s. To mitigate some of the difficulties of online learning, it has been suggested that it's helpful to record lectures, to provide mini lectures, podcasts, to offer asynchronous learning, and then reintegrate that into the live learning. One of the unexpected positive outcomes of digital teaching at the university level at this time has been what has become known as the flipped classroom or students playing a central role in their education with the guidance of faculty members. And some faculty des design the course and guide students in critical reading of primary texts, sorting and assessing the value of secondary sources, including those on the internet and prioritizing and providing support for the tools needed for their projects while students make connections between course materials and their current relevance or work on projects directly related to their current experience of the pandemic. While this sounds extracurricular, this can build upon traditional learning experiences. These can include student collaborations, participating in the critical reading of texts or viewing of episodes or websites and and discussing how to read a visual work critically, building presentations, working individually in pairs or small groups. I've had students tell me that they found this very helpful as a, a form of socializing to work towards a presentation and undertaking research projects that are related to the pandemic. This might be about the impact of social media or the importance of reflection of being able to step away to, to reflect on the ways that they, they enhance their, their life outside of the online learning in the classroom. How do they find a balance? Some of our students have surveyed other students about their experience and offered us concrete recommendations as instructors. Students have also gathered to, to sponsor events once a semester at the beginning of the semester so that they can meet each other. And some through these experiences, we have been able to share resources and navigate this new world together through shared projects. To delve into my experience of weekly teaching more specifically, I would like to share the practice of transitioning from in-person to digital teaching. And reflecting on this, we might note that this was a forced transition as we've, we've acknowledged. We did not choose this, but adjusted to the conditions. Now we might ask, as Christiana Lutka, professor of teaching English as a foreign language at LMU, asked in a recent conference, is what we are doing mundane or revolutionary? I was able to transform each aspect of in-person learning to digital. I even gave students a 15 minute passing time to chat with each other without me in the room as they would when entering the classroom. They really liked this time. That's all they have. Students depended on such encounters. I am afraid this is not revolutionary. This may not be toppling the paradigm, as Professor Burden noted. Not radical disruption, but rather feasible disruption. I've decided as a teacher who depends on continuity and stability that feasible disruption is good enough. My adjustments include the following. I would take polls of students at the beginning to see you know, if they read how they, what they thought of the reading, what they would like to spend the most time on today, as I would in a classroom. 
I would give a lecture, a PowerPoint for 20 or 30 minutes. I would include digital and video and audio, which is actually easier to incorporate by Zoom than it was in the classroom. We would have breakout rooms where I had previously posted questions and then they would gather together as pairs or groups, um, discuss those questions and report back. I would use the whiteboard to organize key concepts, as, again, as I would in class, and I'd offer reflections and conclusions after class and then update Moodle. I also added asynchronous assignments. In Flower Darby's essay in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Seven Do's and Don'ts for Post-Pandemic Teaching with Technology, she notes ways to respond to Zoom exhaustion and fatigue which has actually been measured on a scale. She encourages both personal interactive contact during class through polling and use of the chat screen, as well as asynchronous material to allow the students the time they need to absorb complicated abstract concepts. As one of my students noted, the time needed to pause, take notes and reflect. While the Zoom form does not allow unless the teachers create the space as part of their classes. So I would add discussion forms to Moodle, um, upload course content and current topics. And then the essay assignments, that's our form of evaluation. I don't give exams, but we just have essays. So a final essay in each class, along with the, the weekly um, ungraded assignments on Moodle and then a shorter essay. I would try to explain to students the relevance in, in clear terms of these assignments and to integrate present concerns and issues so that these uh, were more, more relevant, more interesting to them. And we included online research, of course, as, as part of the class, and I can work directly with them to, to look through sources, to evaluate the usefulness of sources and their credibility. They would submit these to me by PDF and we would have virtual office hours that answer questions and, and give them comments individually by email. I would like to note that in addition to my classes and the teaching technologies that, that I have used, I would, in visiting a gymnasium, a high school class in Bavaria it, remotely, it's, their use of audio is worth, worthy of note. Because of privacy restrictions and student choice, the platform they used only allowed audio and not video, except for me and the teacher. So one would think this was actually not manageable according to current expectations for video. But what I found was that when all students were on audio, the situation worked as a radio show. I, after I presented on academic writing for their 12th grade seminar, the VEI seminar in Bavaria, which focused on young adult literature, they took turns asking specific questions about their projects. This is not what I anticipated, but I tried to channel interviews I listened to on NPR. And in this case, with a focus on the potentially embarrassing questions about academic writing, at least from a student perspective, the forum worked. They lined up, told me about their project, asked a question, and I answered. The teacher told me later they were very pleased with the outcome, which offered support at a stressful time and the completion of their abitur. Now again, this was not rattle, radical, but in looking back at the popularity of radio shows, I think we might rework the radio forum in a way that is relevant to our young people. This positive experience was just a reminder that in adjusting to certain conditions, we might find interesting, helpful, unexpected ways forward. In terms of teaching technology, the systems we use need to be assessed for their efficacy and impact with the student's input. At LMU, we have received both teaching, evaluation, teaching evaluations administered by the university, which allow for personal comments, the feedback is personal and confidential, and a questionnaire administered by the FACSOFT or the student council. This has provided helpful feedback on our approaches and concrete suggestions for improvement. Overall, the evaluations have been very good in terms of student satisfaction with their courses, with specific feedback on what to improve. The most difficult aspect for the students, as has been stated in many articles and in discussions with them, even in an independent study project that I have devised, advised, is the isolation and the lack of socialization among students. This cannot be underestimated for this age group. They need support to avoid detrimental effects to their mental health. Students will welcome a return to in-person learning but it is likely that we will still integrate an element of digital learning to enhance their education, also as a contingency plan 
and to allow greater access to courses from a variety of situations across place and time. Along with the innovations in technology that I have described, I am excited about the possibilities to support multimodal literacies through digital pedagogy. These include the following. There are really so many ways, endless ways that these could be incorporated, but um, to give examples from my classes, I've referred to in, in reading slave narratives, for example, the website slavevoyages.org, which is a collaborative project for many universities and organizations and just very helpful. The Library of Congress ar archives author websites, um, contemporary music such as Rhiannon Giddens, who is very much influenced by, by earlier styles. Um, poetry, as I've mentioned, the comparing drama and film through film clips that are online. More recently, um, the portraits of uh, Brianna Taylor and Michelle Obama by Amy Sherald. Uh, there were excellent articles in the New York Times that allowed us to look more closely at those. And also um, to be able to virtually visit cities and places through websites that are dedicated um, to those places, New Orleans, Harlem, Chicago. Um, all of these are extremely helpful to our teaching. I would also recommend the Digital Commons on, that is um, sponsored by the Modern Language Association, their website that has a lot of helpful ideas for teachers and the Chronicle of Higher Education. This is an online publication that, that keeps track of developments at the teaching at the university level and many are um, applicable to secondary schools. What we see is a greater interdisciplinarity uh, among literature, the humanities and social sciences. So we're kind of learning each other's languages and, and how to speak to each other across those boundaries. But it's, it's very interesting and our students are really benefiting from that. I'm also very interested in developments in the public humanities, the outreach beyond the academy, the social relevant themes that have developed, um, the combination of literature and activism, use of book clubs, uh, which you know seems again, very traditional, uh, but I've seen students and um, small groups organize their own book clubs because you know they want something interesting to talk about. It brings them together. And um, I also lead a book club for our local folks, Hochschule Adult Education Center outside of my regular teaching. So um, there, again, there are endless possibilities um, from live streamed and recorded lectures to writing for the general public, which, um, and Marie Fisher discussed as well, that it's helpful for students to, to learn how to write not only traditional academic essays, but in these different venues that they also read. And to engage in purposeful teaching and research to be able to practice that with us. We are preparing the next generation of teachers and engaged citizens. Another positive aspect includes collaboration, which has been long established as a cornerstone of a participatory approach to education, which digital teaching easily supports. Some examples include, of course, presentations, a couple of um, websites that were mentioned that are really helpful to look at by, in Kevin Burton's recent talk, um, bookcreator.com and mobilelearningtoolkit.com. So for um, book creation, and collaborative projects involving online learning. Research projects that related to the pandemic have also been very interesting and have allowed us to work with students um, so that students participate in their, their own education as Paulo Freire has, has always supported in Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And also that they're, they're thinking through and reflecting on um, their experience of living at, at this time. I think that helps them to, both to learn and to have some control over the experience. These are both uh, curricular and extracurricular activities. In terms of reflections, an important part of improving teaching learning always is taking the time for reflection. This might be best accomplished away from the screen on a walk, as I encourage students and faculty alike to do. A somewhat novel idea in this day and age, although that's been our only activity really in Germany for quite some time. These include the challenges, um, the access to computer and Wi-Fi, the financial resources to keep up with this, and the inequality among students that we're also familiar with and um, that, that needs to be, to be changed, uh, that 
requires uh, further, further resources and attention if we want to maintain an equal society. We're also concerned about the teaching load, the coursework, the Zoom fatigue, the socialization or lack thereof, the isolation, and the impact on international education. Now, people say we have an app for that, we can fix that with technology, but we are wondering, is that enough? What can we do in person? What can we do right now to, to help students and to help each other uh, through this time? In terms of the benefits, we have seen a versatility and ad adaptability of administrative fact of staff, faculty, and library administrators. I I've been amazed to see what we've been able to accomplish at this time. And also uh, so many more resources online, ebooks, electronic databases, it's, it's really endless. And um, at, you know, at all levels and in all sectors of society, we're seeing such developments. Another positive aspect of course includes a collaboration, the continuing education that we're all part of in terms of digital technology and interdisciplinarity the broader research and teaching networks that this is representative of, the integration of education, literature, and society, our knowledge of public health and the ways that we're integrating that into our experience, that we're realizing that it's actually not healthy to be in front of a screen all the time, that we're, even in our conference, we're encouraging each other to, to move around and to get out a little bit. And um, of course, we look forward to doing so in person. So we find that um, we are realigning our principles and teaching and research. And I think overall in, in positive ways, uh, as we have stated, this wasn't something that we chose, but I, I do see many positives within that. And I feel like because we've had such a broad discussion overall in a truly international conference that we're really able to come to terms with, with the realities of teaching online. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.